So there are, there are these issues about randomness and probability which used both in mathematics and without. And my point is that you have to kind of, uh, this kind of concept has, has to be redone, uh, revisited every you know, 10, 20 years. And this uh, was long overdue. This probability is the last kind of, uh, the, the, the current use of probability goes back to Kolmogorov. It is 1933. And the idea is 200 years old, coming back from Buffon. It's a little bit old fashioned. So I will, I will just show that very briefly. And so what we can do. Yeah. So this is a different thing which have. And here, and one of the problems is that very thing and the probability, especially in application, said metaphorically, and then as if they were precise, and then people start arguing with that. Especially like in the history and evolution, which people speak about, about random without having specific mathematical model behind it, and then it just, well, say it's meta poetic, yeah, but it sometimes pretends being scientific. And then, on the other hand, the, uh, the most successful probability theory is, uh, is, uh, appears in, in, in physics and, uh, and genetic and astronomy example, I just want to say, that we, we know that probability of Earth being hit by the large meteorite tomorrow while something like one of 100 billion. Expectation is pretty high because we all will be wiped out, but it's still small, it's, it's a realistic number. It's really not, a, not me metaphor because we know roughly the number of big asteroids going around and they distribute it, we know how. So this number may be incorrect, but meaning meaningful. But if you say that probability of a certain historical event, economic event, or biological event, such and such, it's just meaningless. There is no number attached to it. There is randomness, but not numbers. And that's one of the points. You have to review concept of numbers and probability. And uh, this kind of in a contradiction with a kind of historical. Okay. So here, where numbers of probability are not applicable, though people try to apply it, it doesn't work. And there is a lot, long you know, discussion, and in, in, in sometimes getting really kind of political about statistical uh, plausibility of, say, evolution. What is so called Darwinian, I, I use the word, but it's. That doesn't correspond to, to the true historical reality of the origin of the concept. But if you go on a deeper level, where it's more realistic to do something like molecular evolution, even there, concept of probability is not easily applicable because we don't know what is the probability space. And the whole concept of probability space becomes questionable. And then there are two other questions concerning entropy because in physics, you don't so much deal with probabilities, we deal with entropies. Yeah? It's not true that what you observe are probable events. Yeah? Everything we observe is highly improbable, but entropy is just right. That's another point. This is because, you know, this, again, probability, when you start looking at even at physical model, and immediately they go out of the kind of classical concept of probability and the null set, whatever. We observe null sets all, all along. Yeah? It's, but, but anyway, there, there is good mathematics, but However, and this is a big, big question about information in the cells in the brains, and you know, people say, and it is not meaningless, however, we don't know how to make pro proper sense of that, that there is flow of information in the cell. In the cell, you need something like information flows, and also in your brain, something like that happens. And we have no clue how to formulate this mathematically. Right? The attempts, and they all fail so far, for all I know. It, is, it never goes beyond metaphors. And then, amusing point in probability that there are two sources. It was a major kind of historical source of probability. It was not scientific. It comes from gambling, and usually ascribed to Pascal. However, if you look at discussion of other people like Galileo, he was kind of shown the problem. It was obvious to him. I mean, it was obvious for 5,000 years, and it was articulated, in fact, not by Pascal, by Huygens. And so this is. It was said about 5,000 years ago. And there are archaeological findings corresponding to arguing with that. So it was common knowledge among educated people. And then I think uh, Huygens and Bernoulli, who gave it more or less modern shape. And Pascal, it was just correspondence, and he says, we don't have direct evidence. It's unclear to me actually the role of Pascal. Yeah. Cardani wrote some books, yeah, and actually extremely interesting books about that, but then you can argue where the origin of the life, but history is highly intrigued. There are many kind of sources which I don't touch. 
And then we come another source was this one. And this is what I'm using. It also was said quite a long time ago. It was sound 2,000 years ago. And then it, it was misunderstood for 2,000 years and was essentially clarified by uh, these people. Since Lucretio said slightly less than 2,000 years ago, but then it was these people who clarified that. And mathematicians usually refer to Wiener. So what's amazing, there is a model of Einstein, Smolkowski, or Brown in motion, as we understand it now, of that. But I believe the experiments, high-level experiments, may, and it's give you a fantastic precision in the evaluation of a harder number. It's not as good as we do it today, but still pretty good. However, this model is incorrect. Because fine experiments show that these particles, which is uh, moving in the in liquid, and certainly Tito Kretzius never observed them. Yeah? He just came to this idea from a pretty philosophical standpoint. And, uh, and people who worked after them, like Brown himself, understood nothing of that much less than Tito Kretzius, because he was Tito. And again, Tito Kretzius didn't say something original. It was common knowledge of his time, I guess. Yeah? It was not, he was sort of a smart guy, but he was not a scientist. He was a poet. Yeah? And he said many other things. Like he described what is called Darwinian evolution, like in, in, in few lines. Yeah? It was common knowledge uh, in, in uh, ancient Rome and Greece, yeah, of course. It was not proven, but it was not proven. They knew well, almost as little as Darwin did. But, but mathematics was developed later. And again, experimentally, it's not, it's not Brown, these particles don't abide the Brownian motion law. The finding, exper finding experiment shows it's, it's not the case. Yeah. It happens very often. You have a mathematical theory, you have a beautiful conclusion. It works very well, confirm experiments. But when you look at make finding experiments, something else happens, but the outcome is the same. You know, the typical example is you know, elementary mass, mass action equation in chemistry. So particles interact. And so uh, how react reaction goes, proportional to density of these atoms. And this kind of very reasonable, very reasonable formula. And you look how uh, hydrogen burns and oxygen give you very good precision. However, if you look finer, what could happen there, there are hundreds intermediates. And they absolutely don't abide these laws. Outcome somehow does. And nobody understand why. Right? So this primitive, sometimes this primitive approximation works amazingly well. And sometimes they work extremely bad. Yeah, another example of this very poor. Performance is the model, I think, of many people, I think, of, 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 of Born and then by um, you know, quite a few physicists, I've forgotten exactly who was involved, have this model of matter when you postulate position of, of nucleus more or less classically, and then you take electronic field, electronic density of electrons around them. And, and uh, 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 you're showing an equation. And it was used systematically for describing chem quantum chemistry, whatever. But when fine experiment came out, it was absolutely order of magnitude away from reality, which is, you would expect, certainly a very naive idea. An equation is very ugly, unlike the say, mass action equation or Brownian motion equation. The point of this equation, they're mathematically so nice, and they work. And when you make this primitive, naive approximation, and there is no reason it would work. If, it, if justification, not mathematical beauty, but your so-called physical intuition, it's usually. That doesn't work. At least in this example, it was actually discovered about uh, about five years ago that this approximation does it work. When experiment, you know, you can be lazy, you can make a look single molecule, da da da, da and see that this this main naive model don't work. Okay, but now I go briefly because, because and this is actually what we want to get to defy this concept of, of of Maxwell, who expressed the ideas developed until the morning of the 19th century, it penetrated very much the 20th century, that numbers determines everything. And it's, well, it's I think it's in, in many cases, it's not quite that. Yeah, nowadays, it's not just real numbers, but something else. Maybe, sometimes, I'm not saying always. And one point is that, of course, in probability, when people speak about randomness and classical situation, probability works. It works because there is high-level symmetry. And moreover, probability is ends to this symmetry. You start with a, say, a category of sets, and you enhance this to a category, say, of, of, of linear spaces with some extra structure. And there are two kind of directions. One, you add order relation and this kind of classical real probability, or you go to quantum, and then you have complex number structure when order disappears, but something else enters in utility. And But in, in, in both cases, you have high level of symmetry. And this was understood, in fact, already by Cardano, 
who kind of realized that if there is no concept, if you cannot a priori say that certain events are equiprobable, you cannot make any theory. And amazingly, this is a default conjecture. Given two events, given two quantities, conjecture, they're equal. And that kind of looks absurd. However, what else you can assume about them? It's just, if you don't know anything, you say they're equal. Because saying they're not equal is empty, right? So I assume they're equal. From that, you develop kind of theory and see what works. And in probability, that's the whole point. You don't know the meaning of these probabilities. You don't know what these events are, whatever. But you say the numbers you obtain are supposed to be equal. And then you make computation. You can then make computation. And sometimes, you know, it can be easy experiment. Sometimes it doesn't. OK? And then this was formalized by Karl Magorov following, following the, this Buffon. And I think idea come to Buffon. It was, I think, was new idea. Maybe it was expressed by somebody else. But prior to him, to Buffon, it was always discrete uh, settings. It was finite, finitely many events, some of random variables, tra, tra, tra. And he first considered geometric probability. And, and um, you know, this uh, evaluated, actually, he made also experiments, apparently. Well, it's a, probably a apocryptic story, but, but nevertheless, he understood mathematics. And uh, this is another point, by the way, when. Oh, sure. So what happened? Uh, because he was a mathematician, and his major work was, uh, was in, in, in biology, and he was wrote this huge volume of natural history, about 33 volumes or something. And he wanted 50, but he couldn't complete during his lifetime. And then the whole intellectual culture of 200 till, till now actually was determined by this writing. It was a major of textbook. And it's still completely, I think, I can't resist saying that by people speaking about Darwinian evolution, whatever, everything can be Buffon. And he was just elaborating some lines in Buffon, what people were doing afterwards. He was a kind of, and unlike people after him, he understood mathematics. And that's the whole point. And the others don't. And that's the major point. Kind of, and this is kind of, somehow he's kind of, kind of forgotten. Though if he's influenced everywhere, even recently, people were just writing, getting fame for just slightly elaborating what he was saying in one line in this in this volume. And the problem, of course, with him, he couldn't say everything openly because already his, some of his books were burned down at that time by ecclesiastically oriented people. So he was very careful in what he was saying, and therefore easily can be misinterpreted, including by people like Darwin. He said, oh, yeah, don't refer to Buffon because he has contradictory things. Of course, he was saying because he couldn't say openly what he wanted to say. Right? And this is. And then uh, there is this concept of probability as measure in a standard set, and the simple model will be just unit square, prefer square rather than intervals. Interval is one dimensional. You cannot see many things in the square, you see more or less everything. And then it was for exactly 200 years after Buffon Indel. And at the same time, there was the same a very similar idea in, in uh, foundation of algebraic geometry by Andrea Wey, and how this idea was dismantled almost immediately by Grothendieck, suggests that Grothendieck, but uh, Kolmogorov, that also should be kind of revisited and changed. Not that you destroy it, but you look at this differently. And this, I don't know, of course, how to do that. It's easy to criticize, much harder to do. And then, so this concerns more or less pure mathematics. You, know, you want to find different development of idea of probability, and one of the application you want you look after is in, in linguistics. So what is probability of a sentence? What is the frequency of a word? And it's not that clear to say usual probability. If you naively apply it, we have nonsense and what Naumsky and Chomsky said, but because I believe in his mind only naive probability existed, he is so categorical. The point is you have to be smarter mathematically than he is. He's a smart guy, but not of course no, not mathematician. And now he is not even a scientist yeah, these days. And um, so what Yes, I, I can say little alternative there, kind of little touches which I will make, and this will I explain today in, in detail. Number one. The, secondly, is describing probability spaces as covariant functors in the in the simple spaces, and then gives you kind of immediately all the ergodic theory, classical ergodic theory, like Kolmogorov theorem, which were kind of difficult theorem at the time because they were formulated in the kind of traditional language. So measure, measures disappear, sets disappear, and categorically everything becomes very clean. Because you carry, when you speak very often, the point of category theory, you throw away what you don't use. You only, you, you, 
uh, refer to objects and ideas you actually use, but not remember all this history. You, know, you carry all this kind of historical thing, say, luggage, or whatever it is, it's, 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 it tremendously hampers your, your thinking. Even in the case of Kolmogorov, he was even making mistakes in these papers, though they are completely trivial, as we shall see from a categorical point of view. And I exp will explain it again. And then, but there is another, yeah, another one point is that you can use large deviation on standard analysis for, for entropies, and this very much in the spirit of Boltzmann. Actually, all, both using categorical approach. And, and, and on standard analysis, if you have these ideas and you read Boltzmann, what, what he does. And criticism of Boltzmann was exactly mathematician at that time had no this idea. And they were just, you only use kind of numbers as Maxwell understood them. And it was not adequate, not adequate to what Boltzmann was doing. And uh, then there is another point that you can linearize some sort of concept of measures and there are interesting examples when you can do it and you have potentially interesting theories which I certainly only have rough indication of. And uh, then just, uh, I will, uh, there are these, there are these mm, issues in, in languages or in learning what is called some type Bayesian approach to probability which is a metaphor because there is just words and there is no, 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 no techniques, no, no, no systematic way to do that. How to describe, say, languages or learning mechanisms, like learning languages or learning mathematics statistically. These are statistical processes in a way that, that depends on repetition of events. In that sense, they're statistical, they have some symmetry involved. So from a certain point of view, probability is very much of the science in general, depends on symmetry of repetition. Things repeat themselves. But that, from this point of view, say history is not a science. Historical events don't repeat themselves. So what can you say? I mean, each of them individual, right? And this kind of great, you know, but you, you, cannot, you cannot advance it as a scientist, as a mathematician. But something does repeat itself. And but this repetition is different. It's not the kind of symmetries, and they're not groups. They're weaker symmetries. And the question is how to exploit them and how to work with them, that's not quite trivial issue. If you use the language of usual probability, you're dead because your usual language kind of you tacitly assume some kind of symmetry. And then, so I, I gave some references here, because it was, so I, when I thought a little bit and wrote something, something is precise and something is pure speculation and catch wistful thinking, and now I'll speak about entropy. And the point is, well, just because again, I love citation of great people. No. This is, of course, very much again Galilean concept of, of mechanics. Einstein was kind of thinking otherwise. Then, of course, what is reality? And then what was what, what more relevant to what Gothenburg is saying? You have to introduce some childish concept, yeah, so like entropy. So you start with the point of view something you can explain to a child, yeah? And the child is supposed to understand it. However, this I would just to, just to um, say this, whatever you say, you can say opposite. And the, somewhat, there is this mis somewhat misquotation of, of um, Rutherford, who said that if you have a scientific theory, you can explain to an Australian penguin, you better to come up with a different theory. <laughs> he didn't quite say that, yeah, I would say. But it is uh, opposite in a way to what he's saying, and he was saying it not politically correct way. So, <laughs> so I, I say it in this way. So the theory is not supposed to be, it must supposed to be simple for unprepared mind, but not to be simple for kind of already educated, so-called educated mind. Educated mind is a mind like animals have the educated evolution. People, certain, from some age on, become educated, their mind is as unflexible as those of penguins, but sometimes, you know, if you're in certain mood, you can be more flexible. And now, again, we speak about physicists, how we speak about physical systems. System is something vague, and the question is how we can make something precise out of this, and precise meaning we develop parallel mathematical language, and it must be nice and simple, in a simple, in a sense of Grothendieck, right? Not in, in the sense of Maxwell, because numbers are not simple. That's another point. You say, oh, numbers, real numbers, we are, you don't understand them. Nobody understands real numbers, because nobody ever wrote a rigorous justification of, of properties of all real numbers. Yeah? It doesn't exist. Yeah? So real numbers are not rigorous theory. And therefore, nobody understands them. And this, of course, extremely elaborate object, super elaborate, incredible. Why can be such thing as real numbers at all exist? Yeah? 
if you formulate them to a prepared matrix, such, such thing cannot exist. There are too many properties in one object. And, but there are much easier things. And so this is a, how you can think about systems. You don't know what they are. Some, but imagine making experiments, and you have protocols how to make these experiments, and you make experiments, and what you see, boom, 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 all you see. Yeah? And boom, 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 here is a tick, 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 there. And all you can say, this boom, 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 and this boom, boom, boom is the same. And this tick, 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 different from boom, boom, boom. All you have. All information about the world, especially in physics, come from that. There is nothing else. There is no probabilities, no numbers, nothing. And the events repeat themselves. If they don't repeat themselves, you cannot do anything. Right? Only on this repetition you can do it. And because they repeat many times, you can say this is equal, this is not equal. And this pattern of equality, and inequality, out of this you want to make something. And then we say, aha, uh -huh, okay, we know what to do. We take this category of finite major spaces. And this, of course, ad hoc move. However, it has simple uh, rational behind it, and you can explain to each other. You have punch drops of water, many drops, and some drops will come together and become bigger drops and have smaller drops. Total volume or mass doesn't change. And this is a category, how you go from one to another. So you forget these were drops. You only remember these errors. And you speak in the language of these errors, and advantage is this language well developed, and it tells you what to do. Right? It's already kind of. And it's amazingly how much you can say in this language, actually, almost everything. And if you cannot say something in categorical language, possibly go to the higher level, but most likely you're just stupid enough you don't know how to say it. And these people hate, hate, of course, this. People hate category exactly because they don't know how to say it. And they say we have an art, you do it. It's nonsense, yeah. It's usually we don't understand what the if. But of course, there may be parallel language, even more, more sophisticated, more, I'm sorry, even more primitive and more powerful. Because category is the most primitive language which I think is available to us, and therefore most powerful. And it's amazing why it's so, so, so it can engulf so many things. And so these are measure spaces, very simple things, and with this notation which I want to use. And so they're drops of water or pile of sand, and this can become together, and this. And then there is little explanation why. Yeah. Yeah, this, by the way, another point, yeah. It is, again, looks trivial, exactly kind of growth indicator. So it's highly non trivial issue in quantum mechanics. What about a state with probability zero? You cannot throw them away. And this is technically one of the major difficulties in describing quantum probability. You cannot throw away part of a Hilbert space which you don't observe, so to speak. It's all universe involved. You cannot isolate things and say the rest is zero. So you have a function at somewhere zero, but you cannot throw this zero. It's still with you. You change your coordinate system, it's come back. You see, you just, and this is a, well, I, I, when you come to von Neumann entropy, I will explain this. But anyway, this is what you have. So of course, you don't have to have this normalization. And, and it is sometimes, a, a, as usual, normalization is an artifact. And you say, ha, ah, given any finite says you can normalize it. However, you, you shouldn't say this so easily, because you normalize, you multiply by a real number. And all this multiplication may multiply to a group of real numbers. And because you do it many times, you have product of that. So you have a huge uh, real torus, yeah, Pro product of multiplication of real numbers. And if you look and classify them, you have, you have, of course, complex torus. And this act in complex varieties. So you have all toric varieties involved. So when, when you normalize, you throw all this away. Remember, it's all there. Right? So this is one of the points of normalization. You can normalize, but remember, you throw away a huge amount of mathematics. And it's better to come back at some moment, though I don't quite know how. But I'm pretty certain it's, it cannot. It's partly done by some people nowadays. There is some, some work which I haven't studied well now, but it's. Uh, uh, now, this is very convenient physical uh, terminology. A reduction, instead of saying map, you have to say reduction. So it's map between sets and uh, with this property that, yes, atoms come together and they must add up. And uh, again, the physical picture, you have one kind of apparatus and another attached to this, and what you see through a through smaller one, you have a billion windows and something happening, or billion, maybe too much, maybe, but 100, and then another which stands, and see what you see why that. And that's exactly a crucial kind of operation, both in physics, in, well, of course, mathematics, and also, say, in linguistic and in learning. All the time, we can change our windows, and one is a reduction of another. It's one of the patterns of learning, but not the only one. But that's one of the... Uh, very, very nice concept. So then, explanation why we say that instead of this. And uh, one of the justification is not uh, first it has category has no meaning. Sign this error has no. I explained before that 
knowledge of partially ordered set is impossible to define in mathematics. If people think they define it, but it's illusion of definition. They refer to physics. You cannot do it without physics. In a kind of, because you cannot see, when you write A to B, you automatically see the symbols P and Q in this position of the blackboard. If you don't know them, yeah, you, you, they switch. And we know in all that make this mistake in papers, we switch uh, science from, it's not accidental. In our brain, there is no uh, built-in order. Right? We know there are big objects, there are small objects, but order is artifact, and you know, it's hard to learn, yeah? How to read from left to right before right to left. You just you have to break the fundamental symmetry. And, uh, and this is a non-trivial issue. And categorically, the problem disappears. You have F, you have notation, and then you can speak about something attached to F, and we shall be doing with that, right? You can write entropy of F, and, if, and this we shall be doing and defining, but not entropy of the symbol, right? I don't know what's entropy of abstract symbol. It's nonsense. And that's notation, so you save notations, yeah. In order to, or to write this, you have to carry P and Q in this. So instead of three symbols, you have one. So your formula is reduced by, by a factor of two. So when you use categorical like language, and describe the same thing about all that said by categories, you just you throw away half of the notation. Because half of the notation is do nothing there. That's the point. And of course, there may be even better. And now there is this principle which we want to uh, kind of elaborate is that entropy is the logarithm of the number of states of something. And this you can find in some uh, undergraduate text, physical textbooks. And starting from that point, let's try to decipher what P's mean, yeah? And not being ad hoc writing formula like some PI log PI. Right? This, by the way, Boltzmann never wrote this formula. He didn't need it. B uh, Planck wrote this formula for some reason. You don't need this formula. Now, so the entropy is something log that will, be, have, will have this additivity. We don't know what it is, but it might be, have some nice properties. And that's another point. You don't give definitions and everything follows. It looks kind of rather strange. It's something which must have some network of properties, and then amazingly, something exists with this network. There are too many kind of sometimes almost contradictory properties, like real numbers, yeah? And, uh, but then eventually it come up. So far, it's a number. Right? But maybe not even a number, but something where this must make sense. And symbolically, this property I want to write this way. In a second, you usually see why. Because you have two systems which are far away. And being product, being they don't interact. If then, naively, whatever the number of state is, it certainly will be each state here and each state there give you a new state. Because they don't interact, nothing happens. But if they interact, of course, they, they may restrict each other. And then you have this formula. So let me make the corresponding picture. Ah. And this is the picture. Now they're close enough, and they may talk to each other and just say, well, some states may be incompatible. Of course, you cannot have more by having interactions. So this is an inequality. It's obvious, physically, mathematically, people say, ah, it's very easy to derive from convexity of log. But log, you know, you need calculus, you need really kind of volumes of formalism, you know, to define it. However, this is kind of obvious, How, and we want to make it obvious. So indeed, if you have interacting systems, then the number of states is smaller than for non-interacting one, which is kind of obvious, but except you have to. And then there is a stronger property. For st this so-called strong subjectivity, which is essential, especially in, in quantum mechanics, or in, in, actually in classical also, when you have this, so, so entropy is what you, you, you consider different you have a bunch of atoms, and then look at a small piece of them, or atoms or whatever they are, and measure what you see from there. So how many states you see from position one, how many, position two, three, and then there is two, three, and one, two already was there. So I, I, I didn't know how to intact, make overlapping, overlapping, overlapping these uh, parentheses. And this is the equality. And then it looks kind of rather innocuous equality, but immediately it has interesting corollaries. This is one of the corollaries. If you just add them together and bring, you have this kind of corollary. And then this corollary, another property you have to keep in mind that entropy is less than, so set meaning you forget weights, it's just set. And this vertical line means cardinality. And this actually have to need some explanation. It doesn't follow from some naive reasoning, but a priori it will come up. It will come up. Then it is another property 
is if there is a reduction, entropy goes down. So if you look through some window, what you see is less than we were before, which is not true in quantum mechanics, which is incredible. You can look at a single atom, but you're kind of, with the way you look at this, maybe kind of kaleidoscope, and you see many, many atoms, different ones, right? So uh, quantum reduction don't decrease entropy. It may go up, and, it, and it's again, yeah, I don't know exactly. Mathematically, it's quite easy why it happens, and I don't quite understand physical kind of, uh, rational behind it. But then there is the following theorem, which follows from the above, which is binomial. Uh, those always look very formal, must be kind of obvious, these inequalities, in a way. But, but this is not an obvious theorem. And because it implies, it implies a usual isopermetic inequalities, it implies all Sobolev inequalities, and even log Sobolev inequalities. They're all trivial corollary of that. However, it follows from the fact that kind of non-interacting interacting system have a f fewer number of state than interacting ones. And I will explain that. And just, and then if you kind of, but so you need the strong subadditivity plus this, this inequality, and this you can write for in dimension three. So it's to, to, to see relation between what we had before. So, it, so if you have this inequality we wrote before, together with this inequality, what you have is this. So then you understand why the things are related. Yeah? So I have a subset in the Euclidean space. You project it in two planes. And then volume squared of the set is less than product of these projections. And this is stronger than isopermetic inequality. I mean, it's constant, not right. But because in the usual isopermetic inequality, you have here sum of them squared rather than product. So modular arithmetic geometric mean, it's stronger. And, and, uh, and we don't know exactly the geometric kind of uh, full, full kind of geometric form of that. And this is an open question. Is there a similar inequality invariant under the orthogonal group? Because this is not invariant, it's invariant under this very special group, but not under the whole group. And then the amazing thing is, in my view, that this inequality, uh, which we wrote before all this Shannon, uh, this lumis witten inequality, which is about projection we said, in the algebraic language has the following for, uh, shape, which is more general, right? So if you apply it to very special form, namely, you take this measure set and you take function and multiply them, integrate them, and give a name also to one, then become this inequality. And then notationally, let me see if it's clear. So this is, yeah, these are four, four ranks. So you have multilinear form, four linear form, and when you separate variables divided in different points, you have quadratic forms, uh, bilinear form. Bilinear form have ranks. And then there are inequalities, these multiplication inequalities. This is one of the inequalities. Actually, you don't have, for this case, this um, strong, strong subadditivity. You have subadditivity, but not strong subadditivity in this case. But this corollary that you have, and I'm just curious what are kind of the full extent of that. Of course, this is true for all dimensions, and there are many inequalities of this type, everything kind of. This. And this is rather strange that this, again, stronger than all subadditivity inequalities together. It's implied them all kind of like, like, like trivial special cases. You have all the Sobolev inequality, log Sobolev inequality. Everything follows from that, which is in dimension three. Of course, you need it for, for many variables. So I will explain this later on why, well, how we prove it. It's very simple, yeah. Once you have this concept, as I described, categorical, everything comes for you for, for nothing. You just, just do it, what your category theory tells you. You just do it and do it and do it and you come to that without thinking. Yeah? Yeah. I hope I put the, kind of, uh, the uh, exponent right. I think my exponent right. There is some scaling problem. You have to be careful not to confuse which I. And then another application is where entropy enters. And it was emphasized. And this has interesting history uh, related to Mendelian, Mendelian genetics, which allows very much the story, because you, it tells you something I don't want to comment, that when, when this paper came up, and actually you know how people invented, found papers by Mendel. They were kind of uh, in circulation, and everybody could read them. But then, for 30 years, nobody kind of paid any attention to the papers. And why, immediately, at some moment, they started uh, referring to Mendel. Why at all Mendel is remembered? You know why? Because in, at the turn of the century, three groups of people, they discovered Mendel. And they were arguing who was the first. And of course, the smart guys look at the history and ah, it's not you, it was Mendel. 
<laughs> it's obvious kind of, yeah. Otherwise, and I think there are many other things like that, because, but even there is no competing groups, the, the real authors never, never come to the surface. Yeah. <laughs> and then, when it came up, Mendel, most biologists couldn't accept it. And they couldn't accept it because there were some corollary of Mendel, and it was looked to them as if it contradicts evolution. And this kind of very remarkable thing, which Mendel perfectly understood, because Mendel has mathematical education like Darwin, whatever, he understood mathematics. And it is when you have two groups of flowers, say, separated by mountain range, and one of them will be blue and some will be red, and they have, and then you just destroy this mountain range, and they become mixed up. And so the next year, you have, to say, 20% blue and 80% red. What happens the year afterwards? And everybody say, okay, there will be only 2% maybe blue and red. No, nothing changed. The next year will be the same. This mixing is important. It's not, it's not the fit to survive. It's just, just elementary mathematics, which biologists just fail to understand because it was a really complicated formula proven by Hardy, and so I write down the formula. Here is the formula. And this was certainly beyond, beyond biologists of that time. Hard right in terms of P and Q, we just, I just make abbreviation, because exactly, when you substitute P and Q, it doesn't fit on this, in, in this shit, so. And, but then it becomes really formidable, yeah, if you write this. Yeah. And so, so Hardy wrote this formula, he said, okay, it certainly happens, but from my view, he didn't understand what was happening, because there was some simple mathematical phenomenon related to the entropy, by the way, and uh, so what is, so again, the, 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 the object is you. He was quite arrogant about that, but interestingly enough, he wrote one page, and another guy who discovered this was called Weinberg, who was a doctor, uh, it was a physician, German physician, he wrote, I think, about 80 pages proof of that, right? And the point, of course, was not writing this formula, but understanding why this discussion of this mixture of two population expressible this formula. It's just understanding kind of how you apply probability, not how to make this computation. Of course, everybody could make this computation. If, of course, the, the question is to have it in your kind of right mathematical in your mind, not make mechanical computation. And, the, and, uh, and but then what was overlooked, I think, by Hardy, the, the, there is a, the, 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 this is, the, the true statement is, is like that. That when you have this, this map, which I appears in, in the Mendel paper, you look distribution not of genes, but so-called allele, because they are alternative genes. So you have some distribution of features represented by genes, this probability distribution. You, you see what happens in the next generation when they this mix random, random mating. And then this, this is the point. And so what's amusing, the map is a rational function. This map given by very simple rational function, which is written by these formulas. And this is rather amazing that there are rational map, so you square it and the degree doesn't go up. Right? It still remains the same because everything cancels. Right? And so it indeed is kind of miraculous. And uh, yeah, this is a map described here. Yeah. And this map is had this property. And this really kind of there was a reason not to believe such map is possible. Inside of, of, of Mendelian genetics, everything depends on this map, all its variation, uh, etc. And uh, there were kind of further, further developments. In mathematics, quite simple and amazingly enough, it's just what I saw in literature. It's never said what I said. People still write these formulas after Hardy. Yeah? They still kind of obsessed by numbers because they don't know mathematics beyond the 19th century. That's the problem, of course. Mathematics go on far. If you, for a modern mathematician, you see numbers, you immediately know something there, and you don't have to think, kind of. But for, for all the people, it was not so. We don't understand, they don't appreciate really how much mathematics has changed. And now we come to, after all the preamble, I come to the subject. So what I want to say. Uh, so we want to understand, we want to understand entropy in, a, in a, this, simple terms as a log of the number of states. And first, if all states are equiprobable, so there is no weights, then it will be log of the number of states by definition, right? So 
Now, we take this as definition and now want to, from that, understand what happens, what happens in general. And so I have this concept of homogeneous, of homogeneous, of homogeneous spaces where all atoms are the same weight, but this, of course, can be described purely categorically. Yeah, that's important. Yeah? It's a categorical concept. And, uh, and uh, except there is one little point, and this will be essential in, 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 uh, in quantum case, when we, if you allow atoms of zero weight, and then homogeneity becomes tricky because there are atoms all equal weight, say, one or a billion, and then there are zero weight atoms. And that will cause some problems in quantum probability, but here we don't have it. And so by definition, we have this concept of entropy. So this is from this moment on, we, now we make the following kind of observation that when you measure entropy of physics states, you always have repetition of the same thing many, many, many times. And then just let's formalize that. First, I need this definition. So we want to compare two probability spaces. And we compare them, we kind of, of course, on one hand, of course, we are kind of negative about numbers, of course, on the other hand, I, I use numbers. And there are two aspects of numbers, additive and multiplicative. And the probability, there are additive and multiplicative part to that. And so I want to say, when two probability spaces are close to each other, and one thing is that if I throw a small percentage, there are two kind of steps. You can modify spaces and then say this multiplication makes it small. One, I throw away a small percentage of atoms, weight-wise. So one billionth of all atoms, some epsilon weight. And, and if the remaining things are just equal, I say, aha, uh -huh, my probability space, epsilon close. It's, it's additive. And that, again, in... in, in Again, in classical case, it's kind of so, so simple, you maybe don't have to say it, but when you look at the quantum, quantum thing has become more, 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 more subtle. And secondly, it's multiplicative. So imagine I can, can have matching between two spaces, so the ratios between atoms, weight will be small. But small, you must be careful how you normalize it. If, space, uh, if you have huge spaces and the numbers to start with are minuscule, right, the ratio may become huge. right? So you normalize them by the number of elements in this set. And this is how it goes, yeah. So. So you, you put this, when I make this distance, I take ratio kind of of this. But this depends, of course, of correspondence which I give, yeah. So in my, in, I have one category of this, of this, of this, Deduction, but then there is a kind of another category of correspondence between spaces which serve auxiliary role. You compare to different spaces. So you want to compare them, you have to need correspondence between these two subsets. And it must be one, on one hand, what you throw away must be small. On the other hand, on what remains, the ratio must be small compared to log of this total number. Log, of course, because multiplication. Because if they took log on the both sides, otherwise I would have this part. So, and then I add them together and say, ah, this is distance between my spaces. Depending on this correspondence, but again, you take as usual, infimum of all correspondence is pi. Once you say it, ah, I can say, if I have sequences of my finite measure spaces, so I make more and more sophisticated observation, what does mean asymptotic equivalence? It means this difference goes to zero. And then comes the theorem of Bernoulli. Ah, this is definition, yeah? So what is mean is the equivalence? So this distance goes to zero, that's quite clear. And of course, in a more flexible language, which I don't want to emphasize, they become again, because they think it's simple. Anyway, it's better to speak in the language of non-standard analysis. I have infinitely large number, and for this infinitely large, large number, this number is the same. And then, because you don't have to go to the limit, but of course, another way to say the thing may not converge, yes. So, so you have to go to sublimits. And then you define what I call the Bernoulli semigroup of the asymptotic equivalence class of spaces for all P and P. And then there is this theorem of Bernoulli. You apply it to, uh, this is a, Fundamental theorem, which is called the law of large numbers, like repartition theorem. It has many names. It's a very 
I can say nowadays it's a simple theorem, but Bernoulli took him 20 years to prove it. And it is, I, I, don't, I don't know exactly what were the pro difficulty there. I'm curious what were intermediate steps. Because nowadays proof indeed very short. Still, there are, you should have think about, but yes, no, whenever you start doing it, you immediately converge to a proof. It's unclear what was the difficulty at the time. And, from, and actually, it was already understood, but not proven by Cardano. And, uh, and the point is that in the limit, we take powers, powers of, powers of a space, meaning you have repeat experiments independent, and the quantities are independent. So, so you, what you observe, things become homogeneous. Again, homogeneous modulus the fact is to throw away zero states, right? If you look at the, if you think the sets and probability is a function of the set, it doesn't become constant everywhere. It becomes constant on a subset. Also, this subset becomes zero, right? So that's the whole, this is kind of, should be important. Otherwise, you can make mistakes. And so this is a, this is a, and now, why it is the law of large numbers? Yeah, maybe I just say it, and then we make, can make interrupt. I have to put the buttons, yeah? No. Yeah. So, I have these atoms. P's, yeah? Well, I probably have to introduce indices because I have tradition with indices, but actually indices are horrible. They are not needed. And then, so we have this collection of these indices, and you multiply it by themselves many times, yeah? And then what we have, products of this, yeah? So we have PI1, PI2, PI3, ta 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 Many of such entries. And if you take logarithm of them, of course we have sums. And you apply the law of large numbers to these. So, it, so the, the, the point of the law of large numbers, that we do that, you even add kind of random, independent random variables, it becomes eventually constant. If you properly normalize it, dividing it by n. If you do it n times, and, and divide by n, they become eventually constant. And this corresponds to this kind of concept of occurrence I introduced. And therefore, when you multiply this probability space by itself, it becomes, in this equivalent sense, become asymptotically constant. All probabilities become equal. And this very strong property reduces kind of, main, kind of function to constant. And this happens in other instances in geometric inequalities. And it's a very powerful means to proving theorems when it works. When you, you reduce proof for, way, for function to the proof to constants. And this argument, for example, all held inequalities, yeah, kind of trivially follow from that, yeah. Take and you kind of hear what, what Hurl the inequality tells you. You take this integral of function that this, that log of this is, as I keep forgetting, convex to concave function beta. Right? This is what, what Hurl the inequality tells, tells you. Which I don't remember exactly how we write it. You know, it's impossible to remember, but this, the whole thing, yeah. You take product of function to different exponent, integrate, this log either convex or concave. So it's, and, and the proof is, go to this limit. It's x in some measure space. Replace it x to the power n. Put here power n, and n goes to infinity. Of course, nothing changes. All quantities become the same. Yeah. So it's enough to show when n goes to infinity. When n goes to infinity, functions become constant on their respective intervals. For, for constant functions, it's obvious. That's the proof. And, um, and, and uh, Shannon equality is at the same time, but it's more, 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 more profound than Hurd inequality. Though they're related, of course. So, so it becomes eventually constant. And therefore, you know, surprisingly, many properties of Entropy, so defined, reduce the properties of just numbers. Because, for example, what is a, what a reduction for, for homogeneous spaces? Well, all elements have equal weights, right? So this projection means just the composition of numbers. If you have here number n, and you project to the number cardinality m, it means that m decomposes that where these are all integers. So this category of finite measure spaces, when you reduce to 
to this homogeneous object become just essentially multiplicative group of, 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 of integers, essentially, slightly enhanced. Yeah. Right. And, uh, and uh, or the properties, or properties follow from that. So this is the law of large numbers. It's very simple. And then uh, it's only have to see that once you know some property for the dense set of objects, it's true for other objects, and just we come up uh, after the inter OK, maybe I, I can give you one example. Then we come, come to something more sophisticated. You don't have to do even that, in a way, because you can think about entropy in, the, in, in different terms. That so the density theorem what it tells to you, it tells you what are these classes of asymptotic equivalents of of. Um, of powers of spaces. So you consider these growing powers of, of, of spaces, identify them when they are asymptotically equivalent, and, and then I call it Bernoulli Growth Index Semi Group. In a second, or you, in, in, in 10 minutes, I explain why the growth index. And, and, uh, so, so, and then entropy is before you know its number. You know it's something in this semigroup. And then a posteriori you apply Bernoulli theorem and say, ah, it happens to be a number. Because the semigroup is isomorphic to the semigroup of real numbers. But, uh, but in general, when you do in a more sophisticated context, it will be not a number. So why, what kind of point of this definition? Because you don't expect it to be always a number. In a more interesting framework, non-physical framework, you do some, we try to do something similar. An object you come up will be whatever you come up. You don't know a priori what entropy will be. When people try to define information, naively, complexity, or whatever, they just want to have a number. But it's maybe not a number. It's something measure. It must come from the structure involved, and it must come by itself, or it will not come. It will be not a number. And here it happens to be a number, but kind of accidentally. And then, it's, in fact, there are some difficulty here. Maybe I mentioned it, which I didn't quite understand for myself. Yeah, I would, OK, one is, maybe I uh, show. One, by the way, before difficulty, I'll explain it in a second. One is the risk Boltzmann formula, which is mistakenly taken for definition. Mistakenly, you mean conceptually mistakenly. It's not a logical mistake, but it's a kind of mistake of understanding. It's not, and Boltzmann actually never wrote it. He never needed it. And it was written down by Planck, by Planck uh, later. And of course, it is a formula. And it has deep physical meaning. And mathematically, it's completely kind of, it's, it also has mathematical meaning, usually ignored by people who write it, which I, is a fish in the air. There is some kind of mathematical meaning as well, but not, of course, in this writing. But the point I want to say that there is a, um, I want to, I, I come ahead, I return to the way of saying. So there is some problem. How functorial is Bernoulli theorem? So you can approximate these limits by homogeneous spaces, but how much they, they agree with all errors. So you have kind of a complicated, complicated diagram of errors. If when I go to this limit and approximate, I can simultaneously, I can simultaneously satisfy all this. There is one extra property, all fans must be injective. I didn't say what it is, but there is extra condition which needed in order to make it must kind of preserve subjectivity, epimorphism, or rather properly understood monomorphism must go to monomorphism under, under this approximation, which makes no sense a priori because all morphism in category of probability space is epimorphisms. However, there is an auxiliary category when there are monomorphisms, and this must be taken into account, but it's unclear to me uh, if, probably it's not true again, but, but up to what extent uh, Bernoulli theorem is functorial? I mean, this kind of very simple question, uh, yeah, I just haven't thought enough. I'm pretty certain easy can be, you can find, on one hand, to find count example, no problem, but to find exactly up to what extent, up to what extent is functorial. 
because up to some extent it is, and that's crucial for, for this application. Without that, many things become not, not, not so, not so, not just not true. Okay, but this is a, I'm going ahead of myself. I want to return back, and there's maybe a interruption. Now, uh, now I want to explain how, indeed, from this categorical language, you derive essential properties of the entropy. No, this is will come. So here we stop, and the rest was little bit ahead of us. But this again must be understood that this is a stupid form you're written with a mathematician. Of course, it was, again, useful in, the, in Shannon's description when it was binary units, but this is a true physical formula and has really highly non-trivial formula, you see, because it tells you how to, how to, how to behavior of atoms derive something that happens in the real world. Yeah, it's not just this kind of stupid definition, which I, yeah, I never could actually swallow the definition. If you look at textbook and say, entropy is this way, what? Uh, it's not, by the way, it's not. In physics, there is a constant. And then it has deep, deep, you know, a deep meaning because entropy is something kind of you. It's a number of states, and then it can be computed in this way because you cannot compute it from the definition. And of course, that's the, the, of course, in physics, pieces, exposition, people kind of mix it, yeah? And mathematicians, as usual, kind of take the kind of rather simplistic view and, and, and don't explain it properly. So, and um, see, which is maybe just before I go to the one of the essential features I, I had, and this um, sometimes, and again, it's kind of incredible how things are being repeated in history. Some of the trivial points we recently brought to everybody's attention some additivity or multiplicativity of entropy. <coughs> that entropy of two independent systems just adds up. And this is, of course, a kind of one of the most essential features of entropy. It looks very much like probability, right? So where is this? Entropy of A plus B equals entropy of A plus entropy of B. And there are lots of other numerical invariants of that, yeah? So if you only insist on this property and make this kind of bernoulli growth index semigroup without topology, but only use this multiplicativity, well, I don't know, you know, it's impossible to make it faster, unfortunately. It, you have lots and lots of invariants, yeah? And, uh, but they, for some reason, they're all wrong. For example, if you have a bunch of PIs and you take integral of, of, uh, of squared of PI to the power one half, like L to norm, yeah? And L to norm also has multiplicativity. So let me write it down. So the, the, key, the key point which distinguish entropy from other very similar invariant, yeah, this one, additivity of the entropy. There are lots of kind of things that, uh, then at some moment, I, I, I learned from people in applied mathematics, they were kind of surprised, suggested it was written by, in my view, incompetent people who discovered for themselves that if you take almost everything, we'll have this property. I mean, like, uh, any, it's, it's, actually, you think about this in mathematical terms, and you go to Laplace transform, and you have functions that vary at every point. It gives you multiplicative homomorphism from function to numbers. And essentially, they are kind of fascinated by that. There are so many other things, and that's all oh, there are other entropies. But of course, none of them has any physical significance, despite the, there was, I think, the flow of papers, yeah, just maybe in nature. So, if you, some, some scientists kind of discovered this elementary stuff, yeah, because this. But because entropy is not like value of a function some way. It's kind of a residue some way. If you look at the corresponding Fourier transform, entropy will be not a value of a function at a point. It will be kind of a value at a singular point, which makes it so kind of it's more subtle than just value of a function at a point. Yeah. It is a value at a singular point where value doesn't make sense. It's renormalized. And actually, you see, if you look like you have numbers pi, You have this numbers pi, and you associate to this something like summation pi squared. I don't have, maybe you have to take square root, I'm not certain. I probably can, makes no difference. 
then this is multiplicative. You multiply to space being multiplied. You see, that's, that is uh, true. But it doesn't have the right, the right continuity. And for that reason, it does not. It's a priori unclear why, but it's, it, 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 it's not good. But the essential thing is that this defined, this has this property for all PIs. Not, but the entropy only, you need extra condition. Entropy is not multiplicative if you consider all measure spaces, if they're not normalized. So there is normalization factor. So it is not a polynomial kind of, it's a rational function. And the same as in the Mendel map, it's crucial. It's a rational, not just polynomial. You cannot have polynomial with this property. So there is singularity coming from this renormalization. So there is renormalization acting there, and because of that, something slightly more subtle happens. And you have to keep it, of course. Your probability space probably correctly must be thought, not when you normalize it, but when you divide or, or, or remember action of this multiplicative group. Yeah. And then, well, I, have, I don't know exactly how to make it uh, right, but it's not a number even in kind of this, this, this pro, even here, this entropy and this probability, they are not numbers. They quotient by the action of this group, but you have to, but again, in the correct setting, you don't divide by this. There is this group, and you have to keep object together with this symmetry. And, and but I haven't thought about this, how to do it carefully. But that's one mathematical distinction between the two. Before, you see that continuity is different. These are not continuous kind of in, the, in this weak sense. And to be the only one which continues. So OK, so let's make 10 minutes break. Keep in mind, and that uh, kind of essential. One is additivity. When you have two independent systems, you make observation, and the number of states of two independent systems is product of states here and here. Each pair of states give you a state. So entropy is additive. And if they interact, then it's subadditive. Of course, then you have some degrees of freedom being closed because they must kind of agree one with another. But what is slightly more subtle, and it's not so kind of, not, these are two states, yeah. It is this um, strong subjectivity. And when there are overlapping sets, so one, two is not shown there, it's like that because I couldn't make it. But then there is this inequality. And this has no immediate kind of, kind of intuitive justification. But this exactly, formally, in classical cases, just one follows from another, well, it follows again in certain sense, but not, not always. And also in, a, in dynamical systems, also this is sometimes not true, this uh, relative property. And this is one of the corollaries, which is uh, more robust than this inequality, because there is no minus sign, you see? Kind of, in, in, in a way over there, there is a kind of, if you look carefully, if you put you know, entropy two on the right, you, you, you take the total entropy is plus, plus, minus. So entropy two is subtracted, which makes a little bit touchy. And um, yeah, this is something, property of the entropy where this extra point equality holds if and only if the all atoms are equal, it's a homogeneous system. And then there is this reduction property, which looks most, most kind of naively what you expect, yeah, that you have smaller system that has small number of states, which is not true in the quantum mechanics, incredibly. And uh, also, coming a little bit ahead of myself, it's not even true in fully in dynamics. So in dynamics, there is dynamical entropy in up to a certain point. In the situation has been studied by Karl Magorov and people who followed him. It's not only entropy was invariant in the dynamical system, but entropy was monotone decreasing on the morphism of dynamical systems. And, but dynamic was associated with special class of groups, and it was not defined for, for other groups. And then recently, about uh, three, four, four years ago, there was next step made in, in, in there due to Louis Bowen, who kind of discovered that there is a entropy also for other groups, like for free group, which invariant a dynamical system, but is not monotone under reduction. And this is a kind of quite, quite remarkable work where um, very much in the spirit of, of what we discuss here, though, is different. And then 
again, this is a, one of the inequalities which follow, which is purely without minus sign, you see, you see and it and, and, and has this geometric manifestation, geometric corollary, when you project, when you project subset in three-dimensional space on, on three coordinates plane, and so this notation is self-explanatory, and you have this inequality. And you, indeed, you see it's isoparametric inequality because volume, of course, is volume, and here is area of projection, not area of the boundary, but it's up to a constant. It's kind of obvious, right, that product of area of the projection is smaller than the sum of the area of the whole thing, because every projection, of course, area goes down. Right? It's a very kind of crude thing. But here it's a product. So for a certain shape, this inequality qualitatively sharper than the, more precise than usual isoparametric inequality. And again, I don't, it's unknown what should be the corresponding uh, orthogonally invariant inequality. Though there are some results. And then there is kind of rather amusing pure algebraic statement, when it's, which is true over any field, pure algebra. And, and the numbers enter via ranks of, of, of bilinear forms. So you may think everything was about real numbers, quantities, measures. However, this is stronger than it's more general, or rather more general. It's, it implies this uh, uh, three-dimensional isoparametric inequality, the thing about ranks. It implies another kind of very, very special case. See, the point is, if you look at an extreme case where this may come to equality, you arrive at very special diagonal forms which come from measurable sets, so it's not that deep generalization. However, it is for this strong subadditivity is not true in this linearized context, at least in naive form. I don't know it may be. And then there is this Mendelian stuff, which is a really important part for the entropy, is that there is Mendelian map. And uh, that entropy goes up when you mix population, things become mixed up, and equality, they become constant, only we have what they call equilibrium states. And equilibrium states, so it's kind of matrix, which I hate to call this word, because I don't know what matrix is mathematically, right? It's a square table, right? It is not quite mathematical term. And here there are entries. So, so if each entry is product of two entry here and entry here, the equilibrium state, so you have this kind of distribution, and then the invariant under this, under this Mendelian map, and, they, and this is exactly the ones where entropy of the two reduction, so we, have, we can observe from here reduction here, observe from there reduction there, so entropy of the whole thing is smaller than the sum of the two, but if the uh, equilibrium, which means this thing is independent, then, then uh, there is equality, and algebraically it corresponds to matrices or pureris of rank one. Right? So the key point is that kind of rank one, so this projection, uh, this operator is actually is, um, called in algebraic geometry Segre map. The Segre map sends all forms to forms of rank one. And it is um, the most Significant instance of that, of course, is for, for quadratic forms. If you look at the yeah, for quadra space of quadratic forms, and the positive one make a cone, and here there is this projective space of forms of rank one, and the, they ex they ex exactly the convex hull. Convex hull of them makes all positive definite forms. And from there, quantum probability starts, in a way. Huh? This is a, if you replace in classical probability, it's a positive quadrant which defines probability. And here it is a space of positive definite quadratic forms. And the extreme, so you replace permutation group by orthogonal group. So here is a orthogonal group, and here is a kind of minimal kind of orbit acting there. And again, there are lots, lots of very nice and simple mathematics attached to that. But so a little introduction. And now comes this, this quite clear what is homogeneous spaces are. Huh? 
and the key, 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 key definition, kind of geometric definition, analytic definition, is what, how you measure distance between two measure, two probability spaces. And there are two ways to say things are close. One, when you throw away a subset of small measure, or when you multiply all entries by function close to one. But close to one must be properly normalized, because when you have a, uh, like powers, you have exponentially many terms, and so exponent are what you feel. Everything smaller than exponent is small. So you normalize by this log of the number of entries in your matrices. That's the key point. By the way, this when you do, do typically this large deviation theory, there is very annoying number n. You, you, you have some sequences of probability objects, and they're parameterized by, by n, and you take logs of probabilities involved, and these have become entropies, and then you develop this large deviation. But this n is kind of annoying, yeah, because it depends on this n. In this particular instance, n is cardinality of something, but of course, artifact. It's just a number of, which you bring artificially, which is somewhat unpleasant. I don't know how truly to avoid it. Yeah. And the limit, of course, which happens here is, a, is a, what's nowadays called tropical limit, which was certainly known for, for a long time. Mm -hmm. And so there, is a, there are two distances, additive and multiplicative. And of course, they're exactly motivated to the, the law of large numbers. So it is exactly kind of the coarsest distance for which things work. So there is asymptotic equivalence. And then you say define Bernoulli semigroup. You consider all finite probability spaces and take all the sequences, take them in Cartesian powers n going to infinity, and take the asymptotic equivalence classes. And this is, this, is, this is what we call the Bernoulli semigroup. But you start with spaces, and then you go to the powers. And the meaning of that is you, have, you make ex experiments, but you repeat them many, many times. And only when then what you observe will be kind of similar, you say they're the same, because what you right? In what sense is it a semigroup? So you can... Oh, you can multiply spaces. Yeah, you, it is power n. If you multiply to space p by q, this power will be multiplied, right? Okay. Oops. Because PQ to the power N is Cartesian product. Equal P to the N times Q to the N. So there is Cartesian product, and this was not bigger. And, and, and what's essential is topology there. If you make this definition without topology, you have huge, you know, uncountable, something horrible. Uh, uh, thing, <coughs> but even even if you do it, say for homogeneous space with rational numbers, you get something like all rational numbers, or maybe all, maybe even more. I mean, it's, it become extreme. Like usually, forget topology, you get all these pathological things. But this is essential. You use the right topology. So it's kind of when you do a geometry analysis, whatever, it's category with some kind of twist, with some. Ge Okay, so that's. And then this you can, how you can define. So one way to define uh, entropy as a number, you just say, huh, by Bernoulli theorem, any sequence, and I'm sorry, this power is, power is equivalent in Bernoulli sense to homogeneous space. So this homogeneous space underlying it. You take this homogeneous space, take its entropy. It's kind of fixed space. It's not there. Yeah, it's it, you know to really have it in your hand, you have to go to non-standard analysis. The point is, if you go in non-standard analysis, take p to the power n and infinity is homogeneous, and that's your object. But you don't have to do it. Entropy is defined because you normal normalize all the time. Of course, you take entropy naively. What you take, you take kind of entropy of p to the n being approximated by homogeneous thing, and you take log and divide by n, like like. You know, but in other way, and I think conceptually most satisfactory, you, you just have the semigroup, and you don't know a priori it's reduced to numbers, and you just take element of the semigroup. And this is how we can proceed for in different categories. You don't know a priori what this will be. Yeah? You have to, we consider this categories, monoidal categories, here is product, 
when you have some kind of product. And, but what's subtle, and which is not clear even in simple examples, what is the right topology? In, this, in, in, in very many naive examples, you, you run out of topologies. There is no natural topologist. And, and even when you have this computation, proving something becomes difficult, even for classical dynamical systems. So it is usually entropy. It has certain properties. But it's unclear if it's unique with a kind of the, the only topology which a priori makes sense there. And that's not quite clear. And, you know, but that, of course, underlies things all the time. And then Boltzmann equal Bernoulli, and that is Bernoulli theorem, or the law of large numbers, saying that this, that this uh, semi-group is isomorphic to that. And essentially, the same as Bernoulli density theorem, saying that I say density is not the law of large numbers, because there is slightly more. I mean, just I want to, it's, of course, it's technically the law of large numbers, all you use is just the, any proof. But in this proof, and this essential, for example, we have a reduction. It agrees with reduction. It agrees with certain diagrams. It's unclear if it agrees with all diagrams, as I said. But with many diagrams which are relevant for us, it agrees because the proof of that, whichever proof you take, is has some functionality in that. And that is because you don't notice it if you don't think about that. But once you have it, it's extremely useful. Right? And, it, and in particular, when it comes to mm, varies and equalities. And now, so, so, how, so the key inequalities are for us, Shannon, inequality, some are kind of rather immediate. So, sorry, but you say that this is on two, right? The error. No, it is isomorphism. Yeah, on two, so it's a subjective particular. It, 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 it goes, no, it is isomorphism on two. Yeah, it goes on to an in, injection. It's an example of a homogeneous space uh, which is not uh, a, a natural number in, in after this. Uh, hmm? Sorry, sorry, what was the so question? I understand uh, uh, which uh, uh, spaces have image the natural numbers. Okay, but what spaces have a, a real number as, as a? No, but it's, it's, oh, oh, okay, yeah, just any probability. If you take just two numbers, any, any, because eventually you have this formula: sum of pi log pi, but minus. So anything is possible, right? When, when numbers are, are real, you have everything. So every, the homomorphism of H in two carving out of the set of H. Yeah, no? because you go to the limit. You see, in the individual H, of course, the, the, the log of, of integer, but, you, the, this, but log is really rational numbers, but rational numbers kind of dance on the all real numbers. Because we go to the limit, you have everything. But there's no log, so it's just hmm? set. Ah, before you go to the log, yeah. Just, they again will be everything, yeah. Because you go to the power n, you see, it's not for individual spaces. You go, you see, you go to the limit. These asymptotic equivalence classes, which should divide by n. So you have some integer and then normalized by n. So it's at every moment you have a rational number. When n goes to infinity, you have everything. Right? But it's, there is no, no, mm. you see, it is a, we have this homomorphism, it extends, yeah? So homomorphism for integer spaces, for, for, for homogeneous space goes to, to inches, but you extend this and then goes first to rational because you may, we may have, so to speak, you have two spaces such that p to the n equals q to the m, which of course never happens for, for individual spaces, but it happens in the limit. And then we have kind of secret rational numbers. But they're secret. They're not implemented by actual spaces. When you go to the equivalence classes, and you, I am saying you, it's not at some moment, what you have is not actual measure spaces, but kind of fictitious measure spaces. And this, in this uh, growth engine group, that's, that's usually how it works. But again, you don't have to kind of bother about that, that, that much. So the, the point is, naively, that every space, this is just a fancy reformulation of a simple fact that if you have p to the n and n goes to infinity, and then the sequence of homogeneous spaces, which is asymptotic to that. But they're all different. N Varies, yeah. When you make entropy, you divide by n. So this, 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 the, in, in the image, in naive image, they go further and further back, but then divide by n, and so they become rescaled, right? Of course, when you go to n, the number become bigger, 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 it runs away. But when you normalize it, you kind of, so you kind of secretly they do the following thing: you take p to the n and then take square root of n, and then you replace it by h n, 
And so we have something like that. Can you fix this limit of homogeneous spaces? Yeah, which of course kind of doesn't make literal sense. But in this semi-group, it does make sense. You kind of force it. When you say this abelian semi-group, it means you make, you allow these operations, right? You allow this operation, then you have it in the group. But they're not already spaces, they're quotients. You don't have it in the space themselves. And that's kind of the, the, point, of, the point of that, that you, that you introduce fictitious objects. And, uh, but the point is that the, the, it may be something else. It may be, in, in, in general, it may be more parameters, more elaborate, something, whatever. And of course, it may be not the only, the right way to do it. And uh, so let me. So these Poisson formulas we discussed. And then there is this relative entropy. It can be defined in this way, or, which is actually even better, now we have really kind of growth indeed type of definition, right? So it's again for asymptotic equivalence classes of objects. And instead of taking powers, you, you, you just add this relation, and they become truly growth indeed group. And the point, yes, I, I'll write the formula now, I'm going to explain it. So, so if you write it in a certain language, then, so this was the problem we should discuss. Okay. Now there is the following, maybe you, you, you saw it many times, this kind of description of, of Shannon inequality. This is just subadditivity of entropy. So there is extra operation, or operation over, over measure spaces, which is not completely well defined, but in second I say what it is. And, but then this strong subadditivity, which looked a little bit erratic, becomes the same, but for, 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 for morphisms. So the difference between additivity and strong additivity, one is for objects, and another is for morphisms. And once you have kind of right language, one follows from another, and if you decipher this formula, I, I, I haven't explained what this sign oh, is. I'm saying jump, yeah? Ah, it's, it's, it's right here, I have to go see here. So this kind of very simple formula for, for kind of uncontestable formula for, for errors implies rather slightly more elaborate formula for objects. And yeah, so how I jump up very fast and know how it happened. Yeah. Right, so this is a formula for spaces then the same formula for arrows. But if you write it down, you have this somewhat more complicated formula for object, which is usually used. Now, let me explain how things work. So this looks a little bit kind of mysterious, why from this formula you can derive something. And so let's look at the simplest example of the usual, usual Shannon inequality. How you can think about that. So, so whether it's actually fine to infinite measure spaces is kind of immaterial for computation. I can pretend fine, but I make pictures on, the, on here, so it's maybe kind of infinite, so I have a subset. And I project it here and project it here. So I have what it says probability measure distributed in this square, and so I have some probability measure here and some probability measure here. I imagine everything be discrete, yeah, so it divides into little, little, little things. So I don't have care about, don't care about continuity. So, so, so this is one finite measure space, here is another finite measure space, yeah, so everything divided into atoms. And I have, so, here is P, here is Q, here is in the center my R, and I want to say that entropy of R less or equal than entropy, this basic inequality, entropy of Q. Right, so I have this discrete, this matrix, which I project on this and all these coordinates. So I have here measure space, here measure space, probability space. So total sub one, 
are in the center, I want this formula. So this is a division. So how to prove this from this from, from, from Bernoulli's theorem? So you observe that if whether it's true or not true, nothing changes if I take this power. Right? Because all quantities and entropy may be understood if you wish as sum of pi log pi, we share it in the studio, yeah, no matter what. So everything is multiplicative. So I can send n to infinity because all quantities multiply by a constant, then I have to normalize back. And so I imagine I put n equals infinity. And then I'm saying, aha, I apply the law of large numbers, but kind of functorially, which means when I go to this imaginary limit, so what happens? I have this limit subset. No, here it was a measure. In the limit, it will be just subset where it's constant, right? So just subset. And moreover, and here is functoriality. When I project it here, and I project it here, this, this intersection will be all constant. So what kind of set it is? Just look at that. Kind of typically, maybe like this little square into another square, right? So when it's projected, uh, I'm sorry, uh, maybe equal square, yeah? So when I projected, intersection with all lines the same. Observe, uh, I, unless they're empty. Right? And here, all the same. No, but that for that set, it's kind of obvious, right, that cardinality of this set is smaller than cardinality of the two projections, yeah? Here is two projections, and of course, it's, it's cardinality, it may be kind of few. If you reach the whole thing, this square is smaller. All right, and because of the density, because in the limit it's like that, it's true for the original logs. Right? So again, because for set it's true. In a second you see exactly. So what, what you use it, cardinality is monotone increasing under injective maps. And from that, this follows. On the other hand, if you spell it out, in analytic terms, it says the function x log x, I keep forgetting, convex or concave. Convex. I think, the, I keep forgetting which one, but it's in, in, it has second derivative constant side. No, it's opposite to log. So log is look like that, and this look like that. Yeah. If I'm not mistaken, it's a different direction. And, and so it follows from that. So property of log follows it's convex of log from the fact that maps of uh, if you in, embed one set into another, the bigger set has bigger functionality. Right? So you don't have to make calculus. Calculus in there. It's, 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 uh, so. and, and indeed, my objection to calculus is, of course, you can make this computation. But somehow, it's like making computation on the computer. It's no, no difference. Computer added proof or just computation added proof on the paper or in your mind, whatever. This computation is something you go out of your, it's not in your kind of head. It's on the paper, right? You need calculus to do it. It's not automatic. And what I say, up to that point, I don't use any kind of calculus. It's just everything in your head, in a way. Right? This is exactly kind of Grothendix, how he insists mathematics should be done. Everything must become absolutely obvious without any computation. Right? Of course, you accept this statement that in the limit, thing become, thing become. Uh, asymptotically constant, and the proof, of course, there is a proof. It uh, just follows from Pythagorean theorem. If you understand what is kind of Hilbert space is, and that is just Pythagorean theorem. And, uh, and we should give you, of course, more than, than the law of large numbers. So that's one example. The same works for more, but the, of course, on the level of sets, that was obvious to start with, right? If you have any set, then it's area less than product of areas of, of the projection. So, but look at, but relative inequality is stronger, for example, because it, because it implies this, uh, this luminous weakness theorem. So let me explain what happened there. Now we have something in dimension three on in the cube. I also prefer to think everything in kind of, think in combinatorially because kind of continuity is a material here. But, but again, geometrically you have a subset in three space, save, and then you project it into three coordinate planes this plane, this plane, and this plane, and then squared volume of this less than product of these areas. So again, what you do? 
First, it's a material, it's Euclidean space. What's a material, what's essential, a three space is product of three measure spaces, right? So you have subset omega in the product of x1 times x2 times x3. And you call it 1 to 3. Huh? And then volume of this less than projection here, projection here, and projection there. Of course, projection is the best thing to do in measure theory, but we still do that. Now, so one point you have in mind that, and this is a obvious from our definition, but in a way, there is some subtlety here, is that entropy is of a P less or equal than log of cardinality of the set of the atoms. Certainly, when you make the law of large numbers, so what you do, you go to this high, 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 high power, and so what happens? Some atoms all become equal, except the throwaway service zero measure. But the service zero measure may have huge cardinality. Right? You may have predominantly everything. Cardinality-wise, you can throw everything. Right? But measure theoretically, you, you keep it. And so, therefore, of course, this, this, and then you count the number of atoms what remained. So you have this inequality. But it's not at all obvious why equality holds even only if all atoms are constant. In one direction, it's clear. Of course, all atoms are constant, you have this. By or if or only if. And for that, this argument doesn't give you that. So there is some, uh, if you know, because you know a Boyce uniform formula, the pi log pi. And because this function is analytic, of course it follows. However, it's, you need this kind of something analysis, yeah? There is no simple direct proof. I mean, without kind of appeal to some analysis. Of course, you can make computation. I prefer to say a function is analytic, and, and therefore it's unique. The maximum minimum must be unique. It's one dimensional problem, so I select maximum minimum, convex function. I have analytically convex function, then it has only one maximum point. But I mean, just it's, it's, you go out of this kind of language of categories, ta ta ta. And I don't know whether it's, it appears in other instances we'll be using this argument and always having trouble with extremal cases. Here, you can handle it. But say in the case of, in the case of uh, Shannon inequalities for, for, Neumann, for, Neumann, for Neumann, entropy, it will be not that not clear. But, but now, so coming back to that, so we have this point. Therefore, the, what we actually want to prove is that Entropy, so you, you, truly we have some density measure here. If you project on three coordinates, and you want to say that entropy of this less than sum of these entropies. Right? Some because you took logs, of course, other products. Now, so again, we go to this very high power and go to the limit. So here, it was subset any from the very beginning, so it's not a material, it becomes subset. But what is essential, we can assume that all projection of all coordinates, all slices now have constant values. All function involved. And function involved, again, when you have a subset and you start to compute volume, given area, of course, what you do intersect with these lines and integrate. But this was function, now it becomes a constant. And the picture which you have is exactly the only way to have it. It's exactly what I said. It's like this rectangular solid. The only way to have it up, up to transformation you reduce the picture of the rectangular solid. We had before, or maybe two of them, yeah? And so all these projections become constant. Right, so I have kind of this kind of picture, right? Of course, they are not solid. Everything up to measure transformation which, which preserve coordinates. And of course, for that, what I said become tautology, right? It's just because this property is true, yeah. right? Because Projection essentially what you use, you have two sets and project them, then projection bigger than each of them. <laughs> so it's a little bit now mysterious, so I, I haven't explained that. Yeah, I will explain probably just in, 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 in a second I say it, but we will not truly prove it. So this is a kind of, it may look a little bit tricky to explain your kind of what mathematics behind it. Yeah, it's really kind of non trivial thing happens. Yeah, there's this. The law of large numbers mix things and makes things constant. But if you think formalistically how it happens that, how to say it explicitly, that 
Шоу. Мы на тенисе, о в кардиналите. Анда инжектив мэп. Имплай something about measure theory in measure theory. Because in measure theory, all maps are subjective. Right? So we have to enhance our category. And kind of general principle of enlarging any category is considering category of diagrams. So if you have any category, consider any kind of diagram. So any graph, whichever. Where you may assume, when we add condition that certain, that certain um, diag uh, cycles are commutative. And actually, kind of diagrams in our case will be like that, very simple diagram. Then these diagrams in this category make again a category. And so the relevant category for us, for Shannon theory, will be the category of this diagram is fans with two, called fans with two arrows. So you have one object, one space, and two maps. So kind of maybe it's pairs of maps from one space. And now in this category, you do have you do have monomorphisms. And monomorphisms are very simple things. When you have sets theoretically, again, if you translate it back to what you have, it means you have one measure space, P. It goes to Q, and it say to Q1, it goes to Q2. And resulting map in Q1 times Q2 is injective as a set map. Of course, you don't have to say it again. The whole point of category is you, you know secretly. It helps you, of course, to, to know what happens. But if you want to generalize it, you don't have to do that. You just have, uh -huh, you have this notion of injective fed. And then, because of factoriality of, of uh, this uh, Bernoulli factoriality of his law of large numbers, because everything approximated by homogeneous spaces, for homogeneous space and maps, inject injective mean, well, sets goes to subsets, cardinality goes, cardinality goes up, bigger set is bigger cardinality, coming back to entropy, you have this inequality for entropy, that entropy is entropy of P will be less or equal than entropy of these two Qs. <coughs> right, so it means you have a product, you have a subset, and so entropy of this, is always smaller than entropy of the product. And similarly, you, it's work for, 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 for morphisms, yeah? It's the same language, you, you, you do the same for morphisms, and again, you look at all this injectivity, and essentially this will be the, if you look carefully, what is that kind of, the limit picture, it's the one we describe in this uh, lumis whitney theorem, it's, it's a geometric picture, picture which, contains, which contains everything. Now, so, and then, but then there is this point which I was just uh, talking about this concept of this, another way to think about the entropy. That you can speak to make this operation between spaces, and, and then you are. It's yet another way to think about entropy. Because you see, the Shannon inequality, they have many shapes, yeah? And, uh, you, and it's important, relevant, just to, to have this picture of many way to say it. And uh, this is another way to think about that. And how it usually enters in, 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 in textbooks. So this P is not measure space anymore, but they're partitions or a fixed measure space. And, and then there is another partition, say, like that. And this is just what you see here when you intersect all elements. So, and so, and what is the entropy? And the entropy is because you have partition of probability space, you have this weights pi, and you write these formulas. But now we want to say it, of course, without formulas and without knowing what the measure space is. Right? And in fact, you can define measure spaces starting from the category of, of finite measure spaces, and then this operation will enter. And so let me give you what is the kind of, the, kind of pro proper formalism. This is as follows. So if you have any category, and our category is like probability space, but what I'm saying very general, so given any category, we can adjoin something to it. 
We can enjoy it's an object weight, which are, will be covariant functors from our category to category of sets. Now, this is a sound scatter. Formidable, but this is extremely, by the way, general construction, mathematics used everywhere you use it, in topology and in analysis everywhere. It's very trivial, it's so simple sometimes you don't notice it. But the point is that when you have abstract measure space X, And, of course, there are usual definitions of measure space within the null, null set, ta da 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 which is, in my view, yes, never, ever was rigorously written. It's just impossible. Yeah? It's a huge mess, yeah, in a way. Because you use some, it likes explaining what is a matrix. The square table of the blackboard, so what is a blackboard? Ah, I mean, it's really a long, long discussion, yeah? And, and the same there. There are sets, but there are null sets. You, you take them, you don't take them. I mean, just... Absurd, yeah, it's really absurd. I mean, it's a shame when you're doing that. This new, because, in fact, what you have is you have this category of finite measure spaces, and you, you take covariant factor from there to sets with some properties. Now, what are these properties? And how you think about these covariant functors? Covariant functor means to each object here, P, you assign a set. And this set will be just, of course, set of morphism from here to here. So it means you add one object to a category and you allow morphism from this to all other objects of yours. And this is what it is, means. You have an extension of your category. And then there is one particular feature which you need to have it in your measure, to have this, to have a measure space. So in, in, in uh, of course, in, in, in our category, it's very simple to have a measure space, naively called domain and the plane. And so what functor you assign it, what value you assign to a given set. It means you can see the all measure preserving maps, which means all partitions with weights equal to these numbers. But again, the point is you don't have to think about when you start uh, writing things, you don't have to kind of spell it out. It's in, on the back of your mind, but notationally things disappear. So you don't need this set. You don't need these points. All you need is that it is some object in this category, and this makes sense. But essential feature which you need in order to, to have it, is as follows. If you have this abstract x, it's not a space, it's just symbol, yeah? And it goes to this p1, p2, pk. It's not one morphine, but many. It, all of there is in intermediate q in our old category, and this one single arrow, and then it goes from there. Right? Which means exactly that you have many partitions and you can intersect them all. And but there is one kind of maximal object in this category of fan, there is one maximal whatever minimal object. And, and then, module of this object, this Q is become what we call the I, but this kind of depends secretly on this X. And this is not canonical operation. It depends on this functor you use, right? However, its essential property is that this map is, this fan is injective fan, right? So if this was injective, if this arrow is kind of resolving x, this become injective, yeah, this is. And therefore, when we, our inequality, this entropic inequality, follows from the corresponding inequality for map, injective map between sets. Right. So the, the point, and this I will elaborate in my next lecture, but the point is that when you use measure theory, defining entropy of dynamical system, whatever, you don't need sets as measure spaces. And actually, you never use these sets. All computation map is fine partition with numbers. And when you start to interpreting in terms of sets, you derive, you know, you go into problems. Who is measure zero, who is not measure zero? I mean, just you don't have to think about that, right? So all you have to know, you have these measure spaces, you have this operation with this Q, there is secret X a posteriori. You don't care about that. You prove everything, and then you see what you prove in the traditional language. You see you prove slightly actually more than the usual measure theory, because this measure space is slightly more general than usual measure spaces. On the other hand, the generality is fictitious, because they're more general, but on the other hand, everything reduces to usual measure spaces, because kind of there is this kind of universal measure space, kind of, which is eliminate them all, and so 
But the point is you don't have to know all that. Yeah. All this measures theoretic language is absolutely immaterial, and you prove everything. And actually, this uh, uh, I, I will do next time. It's written in one of my papers. But also, all measures theory, like Lebesgue integral, ta -da -da -da, become tautology in there. It automatically comes to you. You don't have to think about Lebesgue integral. There is only one kind of integral, right? Yes, from this from finite reality. If you know something about numbers and these finite measure spaces, if you know what is the sum of numbers, well, if you use, apply this function, you become Lebesgue integral with all its properties, right? And these properties immediately, again, you have to check them. It's properties of numbers, but category theory tells you what you have to prove. And in this, in the, say, the instance of that, if you, if you do it in ergodic theory, and this is Kolmogorov theorem, if you go to this category and you know what he proven, that entropy is invariant of dynamical system, but what was his contribution kind of is, that this converges to one when it goes to infinity. And that's all you have to be. Everything else is just, you know, hand waving in categorical language, right? And this kind of, of course, this hand waving is okay when you have this language. If you don't have it, it's not so, not so easy. And so next time I will explain to you how from finite measure space you go to infinite measure spaces. And, uh, but this, of course, is only one path. It's not, it's not uh, as, I, as I think, it's, a, in kind of, it's you, know, you just clean up classical things. The question is, what should be the new thing? Yeah? And then they do the same with for Neumann. Uh, for Neumann, for Neumann prob for probability, for Neumann entropy, but then things will become more, more, more problematic, yeah? So what you can do, uh, uh, and I just, I gave you, oh, it's already disappeared. Oh, shit. Incredible, huh? Because again, just returning back to my schedule, I want to show you what you would expect us in future. No, I don't want to move. Click, click, uh, uh, click on what? Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh -huh. okay, I want to return just to, to so what, what, what expect us. I don't know how to make it fast. No, maybe it's too long, yeah. Because so we, we, we will do through this all kind of entropies, and then I want to describe measure theory cohomologically. Because in, when you look at the physical system, like system of particles, topology, they're by far more, yeah, no, it's too boring to go for that. That topology will be playing, replacing, not playing, replacing, replacing numbers. Where, 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 where is, where is more, what is more interesting? Okay. Oops. <laughs>